We're going to look at several passages this morning that Mike has outlined, first beginning with 1 Samuel 18, and you can turn there, 1 Samuel 18, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 18. And if you want to, you can go ahead and flip over to Psalm 33 and 1 Samuel 9, which would just be a few pages before, and we're going to look at a, just one verse in each of those. Okay, verse excuse me, with, uh, beginning with 1 Samuel 18, starting with verse 8. Then Saul became very angry, for this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual and a spear was in Saul's hand. And Saul hurled the spear for he thought I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped from his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David for the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from his presence and appointed him as his commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David was prospering in all his ways, for the Lord was with him. When Saul saw that he was prospering greatly, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, and he went out and came in before them. Then Saul said to David, Here's my older daughter Merib, and I will give her to you as a wife. Only be a valiant man for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, my hand shall not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. But David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? Now turn over again to Psalm 33. Psalm 33. And we're going to look at just verse 8. For let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And now, flip back to 1 Samuel 9, just a few pages before. We can just look at verse 21. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? and my family, the least of the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me in this way? We pray that the Lord will bless this reading of his word and our study in it this morning. Mike. Thank you, Warren, and good morning. It's been forever since I've been here, it seems like, uh, uh, due to our speakers that we've had. I brought five copies of uh, the Providence book, uh, John Flavel, for those of you who said you didn't get one. Uh, If you still don't have one and you want one, uh, let me know, we'll get more. That's a wonderful thing. I was with Roy yesterday and he was quoting from that book, and that was so meaningful. Thank you, Roy. Uh, It reminded me of Eric Alexander. I picked him up at the airport, and he had been reading uh, one of the Puritans, and he kept referencing what he was reading from uh, the particular book he was referring to at the time. Meditating on the Word of God and the things that the men who went before us, those gifted teachers, can instruct us from the Scriptures. Well, we are in Lesson 13, The Rise of David, a King Without a Kingdom. And today we come to the point in our lesson where Saul is transformed from amazement with this young David to uneasiness to actually a plot for his death. 
this shepherd who we now have come to know as and recognize as the true king of all Israel is going to ignite in our story today the jealousy and fear in Saul. This occurs in the first place regarding the excitement of the day. David returned from striking the Philistines and the city's women came out singing and dancing to meet Saul with tambourines and songs of joy. Their lyrics, verse 7, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. There had been in earlier times with the king, Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5, when those songs that were sung were all sung to and for him. But now there is a new personality in the mix. This idea of putting a number in the first line and then beefing up that number in line two is just standard Hebrew poetry and style. Uh, in no way was this little ditty sung by the women uh, in any way a put down of Saul whatsoever. But he didn't like it. He didn't like it at all. What more can he get, he says, than the kingdom? Let's mark together explosion number one, revealing the inner mind of Saul. Dr. Bruce Walkey, who was with us here at the chapel to lead a small seminar, about 15 of us uh, in the Psalms. In his uh, Old Testament theology, he describes this as self-talk. It occurs more than you would think in the Bible. By the inspiration of the Spirit, our writer, our narrator, takes us into the mind of the individual himself. If you've been around me or my instruction for very long, I tend to address it this way. The most important voice that you listen to every day is the voice that comes out of your own heart. Now, I'll give you two illustrations of it. It occurs with the rich fool. You don't need to turn there. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, 7, the Scripture says he thought to himself. And in verse 19, he says, I will say to myself. Self-talk. The apostle giving us instruction. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. We are, he said, to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And again, the apostle, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, says we should have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, to be thinking his thoughts after him. Rosemary Jensen, when teaching the women of Bible study fellowship, she says, when a thought appears in your heart or in your mind, they're one and the same in the Old Testament, stop and ask yourself, what is actually true about what I'm thinking or what just appeared to me? That's a discipline for our minds. We are attacked often in our minds. And Jim Boyce's instruction from the Bible study hour proclaims helping us to think, to think, and then act biblically. As a man thinks, so he is. But Saul couldn't do any of that. That's the point. 
the man continues to just simply unravel right here in front of us. Interesting. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 13 in verse 4, before our study began, his son Jonathan had won a great and valiant victory over the Philistines. But all Israel had really heard was that Saul had done it. Does a king have to share his glory with another? Certainly not. But the point is it didn't bother him then. <clears throat> Which provokes us to ask, uh, can you be a number two, three, four, five? A nobody? Blend in? Does it bother you that you don't get top billing for something? Before Israel took the land, you know Joshua was Moses, number two. Hardly referenced. Can you be a Barnabas to an Apostle Paul? Or is it important that people remember your name and you get the recognition? When we studied with Dr. Walkie two weeks back, he, he laid some jewels upon us that I immediately circled and underlined. The greatest epitaph in all of the Old Testament, he said, was to be known as a servant. Before I became a Christian, I listened to several hours of reel-to-reel -reel tapes from a teammate of mine. He carried and lugged around this big tape recorder with all these reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and we would meet on Tuesday evening at 8 to 9 to listen to those reel-to-reel -reel recordings. I don't remember anything about them. I wasn't saved, but I do remember the person's name. It was Dawson Trotman who started the Navigators nationwide ministry. After I got saved, I came across that name and I thought, I'll look him up. Wonder what he's doing. Well, in fact, he drowned at Lake Shroon in New York. Funeral, of course, was packed. It was a shock to the Christian community across the country. Billy Graham delivered the eulogy. And he said this, Dawson Trotman died as he lived, always lifting someone up. He had been in the boat, and he and a young lady had, had taken a sharp turn, and before we had rules and laws to wear life belts. They fell out. The boat spun around, and Dawson helped lift the young girl up into the boat, and they took the second spin around to get him, and he was gone. There was a writer in the audience that day from Life magazine. He was a Christian. And he took that line of Billy Graham's and he submitted the article for Life magazine and it got published nationwide entitled, Dawson Trotman, Always Lifting Someone Up. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, He came to serve, not to be served. How are we going to remember you? How are we going to think about you when you're gone? Well, Saul's jealousy leads to the second explosion, and that is verses 10 and 11 here. This, these texts from here on are going to be now 
loaded with contrast. We'll see them back and forth in our exposition. Earlier in our study, we began uh, before our time with the Spirit rushing on David. But prior to that, in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 10, that Spirit rushed on Saul as well. And as I said, it was the experience of David when he was anointed by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13. The Scripture says, from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. But here's the contrast. The spirit that now currently occupies Saul is now evil and harmful. Now remember, to keep our Pauline theology straight, even from the Old Testament, this man has been rejected And this evil spirit is a consequence of his unfaithfulness. That's what happens to a life of disobedience. When we don't hear the Word of God, nor follow the Word of God, we inherit the consequences. So, Now, look at your word here, verse 10. You may have prophesied, or your translation may be raved. Earlier, it was virtuous and positive for Saul, but no more. No, no more. It leads Saul here into a frenzy. Now, here's the contrast. Notice, David, with the Spirit from the Lord, His hand is upon the lyre, which is used to refresh the king and minister to him. And Saul, look at his hand. It's upon the spear. And David becomes his target. Whatever initial love Saul had for David, (laughs) that's gone, long gone. Due to uh, David's quickness and agility, which are gifts from God, he quickly eludes the spear. And in the providence of God, David was for his part... Now think about this. This is the way you have to think about narrative. Narrative... In narrative, everything is important. You have to stop and you have to think and ponder the Scriptures in narrative because think of what's going on here. David is at the right place at the right time serving when suddenly the spear I think this is the perfect time in the narrative to remind us all, don't try to figure out the evil of other people toward you. Don't waste your time on that. Why would a person who you have been good to and good for, suddenly turn on you. This happens. Happened to me. It's painful. You want to have your say. You want to set the record straight. But you can't. Because you see, the providence of God is going to prevent it. David, for example, he can't defend himself against the king. The king, he's got the flags and the trumpets and the army. 
He has the title. He has the instant credibility. Just like Potiphar's wife. She had the high position in the household. What did Joseph have? He's a common slave. Dr. Johnson, in a conversation, told me as a young seminarian one day, it's not what you do, but it is how you respond that's important. David here ran away and said nothing. He preserved the peace. And that is both wise and admirable. The Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 12, verse 18 writes, As it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That's what David does. But for those of us who have been put in this unexplainable providence of being attacked suddenly, broadsided. Let me show you some encouragement from God's text here. I want you to notice verse 12. The full force of Saul's wickedness now falls straightway upon him. Now he's afraid. The inspired language actually reads this way. Saul feared David's face. And verse 15, and he stood in awe of that face. That's the literal reading of the inspired language. Now, these two terms, fear and awe, occur in the Old Testament. In one place, Psalm 33 and verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord and the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. When Dr. Walkie was here, he really went out of his way that first morning to emphasize the fear of the Lord. And here's what he said. It's much stronger than reverence. Much stronger. And he described it this way. The creator of the universe, he says, means what he says. That got my attention. This term awe, the fine scholar Alan Ross says mankind should be intimidated by one who is superior and far more powerful than we are. The psalmist attributes both terms to the Lord. But here's what is significant regarding our narrative. Notice our writer in 1 Samuel, now applies these two terms that were used of our attitude toward the Lord as what Saul saw. And what did he see in David? Fear and awe. I thought about that. I thought about that long and hard. And God gave me two texts. The first, Exodus chapter 7 and verse 1. It is the Lord telling Moses, See now, I have made you like a god to Pharaoh. Now, think about the context. Egypt had all kinds of gods. 
God for everything. And Moses' appearance with these powerful miracles in the mind of the Pharaoh, this guy's like a god. That's the point. Here's the second text. John chapter 19 and verse 8, it says, Pilate became more afraid. I want you to close your eyes and see that verse in the context that it occurs in. The context is this man Jesus who has been up all night and has been beaten and has a crown of thorns on his head and he's standing before this imperial power of Rome and its representative. He is like a wounded animal with nothing. The moment of the index finger of this powerful Roman, they'll cut off his head. But look what the Scriptures say. When that was happening, Pilate was afraid. He was afraid. You know what we learn from this? Been blindsided by someone who you've been kind and good to and generous with? Well, you just keep walking. You just keep walking. Because you and I have no idea what's going on between their ears and what the Lord God is doing to them. The inspired language tells it all, doesn't it? The fear and the awe of his face. Here's what we do know with absolute clarity from political reality. David lost nothing. Nor will you, nor will you in your goodness and kindness to people who turn on you. Here's what's truly important. Verse 12. The Lord was with David. And again, verse 14. The result. Verse 16. All Israel and Judah love David. He succeeds and actually and increases in popularity. Now, beginning in verse 17. Saul now sets two traps for this young shepherd boy for his demise. The first and the only one we'll get to this morning, verses 17 and 18, using his eldest daughter Merib and her marriage proposal. You have a son-in-law? Want to kill him? <laughs> well, back when this gargantuan Philistine had Saul and Israel in a hopeless and helpless place, it was common knowledge among the soldiers in the Valley of Elah that Saul was offering his daughter to anyone who would rid the earth of this menace. But here, now, we have a new proposal. Look, become a brave man for me and fight the Lord's battles. Become. Now look what good students you are of narrative now. You know that is a transition word. Narrative. It tells us 
Saul is resetting a paradigm for new bravery in Israel. Let's see. It is become and I will give. Now, isn't that rich? Coming from the man who had no heart whatsoever to face that giant. He stayed in his tent. Telling us again and again the person we're really dealing with here. <laughs> Saul gives nothing unless it ultimately fulfills his own selfish purpose. Know anyone like that? Here's what he says with the word thought. We're again taken to his sinister motive in his own mind. Let not my hand be upon him. Let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. The hand here, a figure for divine providence. My hands are going to remain clean. You see, if the glove doesn't fit, you must quit. We'll let some other bloody Hands of the Philistine carry the gloves. And so, with a clean conscience, Saul, of course, verse 19, he doesn't give his daughter to this shepherd boy. He defaults on the offer, giving Merib to another. Who does that remind you of? Just like Laban. Well, it's what Laban did to Jacob. You remember? In his deceptive wickedness, Genesis 31, 41, he barters away his daughters in marriage to sell, to serve his own selfish person. Mark the personality that considers people as pawns. A few weeks back, I got a call from a friend of mine and he said before I sign this letter I want you to be the first to know and we rejoiced together his father had started the company he had built the company and now he was signing the letter of intent for sale of the company we rejoiced and then it was just Ten days or so later, he calls me back. He had been with the principals and the attorneys, and they were changing the deal. He called me for counsel. I said, let's get together. And I showed him these two verses. Who changes deals in the Old Testament? Clearly, those who have selfish and greedy motives of heart. Look, don't waste your time on people like that. They're just worthless fools. Their proposals are not worth the paper that they're written on. Our Lord instructed us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 37 to let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you're not certain about something, then pray and keep praying until you have clarity and peace about everything. And when God is in it, my friends, it'll go very smooth. Verse 18, the contrast to this deceptive plotting of Saul is the humility of David marked for us by the rhetorical questions. You see them? Who, what, that, should? Followed by his own self-abasement 
my life, my family, my conditions. It's a reference to himself as a simpleton. I'm just a, a simple shepherd. A nobody, really. Not in relation to you, O king, and your authority. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Here's the straightforward economics of the kingdom to come, my friends. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And so with that, we have a final contrast for our lesson this morning, and it is found as Warren read it to us, 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 21. It really occurred before our study began the rise of David, 1 Samuel 16. But here it is, preserved by the power of the Spirit for our instruction, 1 Samuel 9, 21. Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest among all the families of Benjamin's clans? Why do you speak to me in such a way? That, my friends, was a young Saul. Bewildered at the strange words of the prophet Samuel of hearing about him becoming king of all Israel. Jonathan Alter calls it the etiquette of deference. Respectful, courteous, yielding in judgment to others. Notice how it opened again. Look at your text. Am I not? How close is that to the self-deprecation of a shepherd out on the Midian desert before a burning bush? Exodus 3.11 and saying, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh. Or to a young and valiant warrior by the name of Gideon in Judges chapter 6 and verse 15. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least of my father's household in that clan. You know what Samuel said to Saul when he told him that God's finished with you? He gave him a little history about himself. The words directly from the Lord. And Samuel repeated them to Saul. Here's what he said. 15:17. There was once a day when you were small in your own eyes. And the Lord anointed you king over all Israel. He had been given the opportunity, not of a lifetime, no, not of a lifetime. Not of a lifetime. Are you kidding me? There have never been a man on the planet in all of history that's been given the title King of the Lord's people. And he squandered it. He squandered it. 
He took that precious gift and He threw it out like you throw out dirty bath water. And how did He do it? By spending all of His days on Himself. I got a text sent to me just last week. It was an x-ray. I didn't know whose x-ray, but it showed a large mass attached to the brain. It was very obvious. I found out it was a business partner of mine about 15 years ago. I rushed to the hospital. I met with him. Met with him several times. He had surgery this past Friday. And just a reminder, just a reminder, I said, walking back to the car, I don't have much time. There's not much time left. But you and I have today. I don't have tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. But we got today. We got today. Oh, my friends, today, if never before in your entire life, today, be a servant. Become a servant. Serve others in the name of Christ Jesus who came to serve us. Be a servant. It's the highest calling in all the Old Testament. And as I'm walking across the pavement to get in my car from seeing my friend, I said to myself, life is short for me today, but the Lord can even make it shorter. And today, and today, and today, fear the Lord. Fear Him with all your heart. It's more than reverence. For God means what He says. And that alone should shape the remainder of our days until our last breath. Amen. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for Your eternal Word that speaks to us even thousands of years later in the context of our own lives. Lord, give us Your grace to see ourselves rightly and not squander what we have been given, the preciousness of the Christian life, the wonder of our Lord Jesus, who, though rich, became poor for our sakes and served us to teach us to fear the Lord. And we ask this in the powerful name of all names, Jesus Christ. Amen.